Um, uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome you to our next collection stewardship panel. And this one is um, the last for this virtual conference. It's Collections Conundrums. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Linda Endersby. I'm registrar at the University of Missouri Museum of Art and Archaeology in Columbia, Missouri. Um, and I'm also the chair-elect of the Collection Stewardship Professional Network. Um, I did want to take one moment to um, thank uh, the current chair of Collection Stewardship, Sebastian Encina. Um, he played a leading role in turning our um, little idea of a virtual free mini conference into reality with, with what I think has been a great series of presentations. He's made a hard act for me to follow, but um, he's really taken this on um, and pushed forward with it. So um, I think it's great. And I do want to say, even though this is the last one for this session, um, Collection Stewardship will be doing other webinars periodically, um, including there's probably one coming up this summer that Sebastian will be doing on the new General Facilities Report. Um, so some other things to look forward to. Um, uh, just a couple of Zoom logistics. Um, I hope by now most people are gotten used to Zoom, but um, this is actually a Zoom webinar versus a meeting. Um, so you'll see the panelists, um, but we cannot see or hear you. Um, at the bottom of your screen, probably, there is a Q&A feature, which is part of the webinar. And we ask that questions will go in there. Um, there's a chat box where people are already saying hi and communicating with colleagues um, all across the country. And you're welcome to do that. But we do ask that questions go into um, the Q&A feature. Um, this webinar is be re being recorded and um, it will be made available later on both our website and Collection Stewardship has a YouTube panel. Um, if you have any trouble with the Zoom, there's the link for the support center or you can um, send me a note through the chat box or there's my email. Um, I will try to watch that um, as well, but hopefully I've sorted some of those things out through the previous two um, previous three webinars that we've done. Um, this presentation is going to be divided into four topic areas roughly and depending upon time at the end of each one of those um, the panelists may take a question or two from the audience. So again um, we will be looking at the Q&A feature um, for those. Um, for now um, We've got three distinguished panelists, Suzanne Hale, um, registrar at the Gregory Alicar Museum of Art at Colorado State University, um, with all those wonderful trophies in the background. Um, Janice Klein, executive director of the Museum Association of Arizona and the recent um, winner of the Dudley Wilkinson Award. Um, so congratulations to her again. And John Simmons, consultant extraordinaire and curator of collections. Um, at the Earth and Mineral Science Museum at Penn State University. So at this point, I will now turn it over to Janice and the panelists to, um, to start this out. Hi, um, I'm just going to give a really brief introduction um, to sort of give us some things to talk about in case nobody had any questions online. Um, we went back through some of the past questions on uh, the collections stewardship listserv. And we also threw up a, I'm gonna have to stop saying throw up. We put up a uh, survey monkey uh, poll, um, just asking for some questions. And we were, um, I'm not sure, somewhere between shocked and pleasantly surprised that, uh, you know, in the four days that it was up, we had a lot of people responding. Um, so we um, looked at the questions and um, this sort of graph of what concerns were, and then we decided what we could actually answer or talk about and went with those. Um, so the first set of questions that we, or the first topic we want to look at um, is uh, collections cleanup. And ready for that slide, Linda? Uh, there we go. <laughs> 
Are you moving on? Yeah, we got okay. So here are just some of the topics that, that came up. Um, everybody has a collections cleanup issue. Um, we basically agreed this is your answer um, to that question. Um, but um, John, do you want to sort of take any of these in specific or things that have to do with collections cleanup? Uh, I will agree with you. Angela Kipp's book is a great way to start her. It's managing previously unmanaged collections, but even if you have a previously managed collection, you will find many, many, many useful hints in the book. And the best thing about it is her sense of humor comes through. And if you're faced with a collections cleanup, that's what you need. Uh, I will say that um, the museum where I'm I currently am a volunteer creator of collections had this issue with collections cleanup in, in the sense that when when I came and started uh, they had an all, all new staff a new director and assistant director and none of us had ever seen the collection before because it was boxed up the museum had actually been closed to shut down and they were going to close it and decided to reopen it. So we were faced with the task of opening the boxes and trying to create a database. And all we had were inventory sheets with numbers and basically no data. And we, what we did was after some mulling, mulling about how to go about it was we used our inventory numbers and converted those over to be uh, catalog numbers. We put all the numbers in, we checked to see what we had, what we didn't have. Once we had numbers in the database, then we started looking for documentation that uh, would add value to those specimens because we found that once you had the numbers in your database you've got a structure you can work with we then started going through old catalogs old paper files card files we found boxes of purchase receipts all sorts of information like that that we've been able to use to flesh out the information so you know it's it's hard to figure out where to start when you start from zero but i think the best thing to do is start with figuring out what you've got and go forward from there don't get hung up on does this object have adequate documentation or not not. Go ahead and get it into your database. You can then work with it. You can then find associations, but start with that. Figure out what you've got and then go forward. Yeah, one of the things that, that Angela says in her book that's a re I think is a really useful one is that we're very used to documenting individual objects uh, and focusing on the individual object. And when you have a huge, un when you've got a, a big chunk of collection, whether it's you know a backlog or whether it's a problem that's been sitting there, um, you really need to to look more holistically and say you know all right there there are all these kinds of things how do I you know sort of separate them out to start with, um, and also not to worry too much about assigning numbers um, that. Um, Numbering, numbers are really the way you link your individual object with its record and it, for getting started it really doesn't matter what system you use as long as the object has the number on it and your record has the number on it, um, you don't have to worry about it. Um, there's a question here about duplicate records um, and um, my tendency has always been to put the absolute minimum in the, the record that I consider to be the secondary record. Um, usually I will put, even just in the object description, see the other number. Um, there was some concern about uh, some discussion, you know, if somebody's searching on the geographic field or the object field, they're going to come up with more objects than we actually have if I actually have that duplicate record. And that would be my tendency to really just put um, the bare minimum of information into the second record field. Yeah, it's worth considering why that duplicate record is there as well. Was it a mistake? Uh, is, was there a purpose in doing it? And if it's, if, you know, if it was an obvious mistake, that's a good time to eliminate them. But you shouldn't do that until you're confident that you know why it was created. Somebody created it for a reason. It may have been an inappropriate reason. It may have been a very appropriate one. And it's, you don't want to second guess people until you're very confident and comfortable with the collection and the way it was handled. And you want to try very hard not to write in your own personal records. My predecessor was an idiot as the reason. 
<laughs> Only if they're dead. <laughs> One thing I, I might add to about some of these things too was if you find you might want to be aware of what your state laws are about abandoned property. If there are things that you go through and decide that this certainly is not what we would want to mm -hmm. have in our collection. And then also know about um, if you don't have the records you need, then when you can actually sort of claim it um, and those types of things. Yeah, there is a, an up-to-date list of abandoned property laws by, state by state on the ARCS website now, and we are going to attempt to, to keep that up as much as, as, as soon as we find out other states have added those, but that is a very useful thing to have. Yeah, there was a question about where do I find it, and the ARCS website is probably the best resource right now. Yeah. Um, do we want to move There will on to be the a list in, in the new edition of museum registration methods as well. Sure. Yes, I think so. Move on. Yeah, there is a question specifically about dealing with permanent loans and other okay. abandoned property. Okay. Do you want to say anything about that, that, especially if your state does not have a law? Hmm. Uh, there is no such thing as a permanent loan. That is a, an oxymoron <laughs> I would like to gore. Uh, if, it, if it's a loan, you do not own it. If it's a gift, you own it. If someone gives it to you permanently, it's a gift. So I, I know that phrase was used a lot. It really meant long-term loan. The reason it's important to keep in mind that there is no such thing as because if it's on loan, you do not own it and you are very limited in what you can do with that object. So don't think of it as a permanent loan. Think of it as a long-term loan that overstayed its welcome or, yeah. or a gift. Yes, and it's thank you. Thank you, John. That. That is a, um, and every state um, has abandoned property legislation. It does not necessarily have legislation that applies specifically to museum material or to loans. Um, and the, the move uh, I hate to think about how long ago it was, 20 years ago maybe, by collections professionals to get specific um, uh, legislation is that uh, very often state property laws um, don't um, speak to what the needs of museums are. Um, so um, if your state does not have a, a law, um, we can, uh, there are lots of people who can help um, you figure out how to draft one, but your state will have an abandoned property law. Every state does. It just and may not work well, well for you. You may also want to connect with different institutions that have already dealt with this problem in your state because they probably said, oh yeah, we ran into that problem and this is what we're doing. And that might be helpful as well. Um, so our, our next set of questions have to do with uh, archival materials. Um, and um, this has been a, a, a rising issue in um, uh, collections world because um, there are many cases where paper uh, materials related to the collection um, are actually uh, of historic value in their own right. Um, they're not just uh, documentation of the uh, collection, which uh, most of us put in a collections file of some sort, um, but they are actually um, historic documents on their own. Um, and um, I'm kind of going to throw this one um, not to the side, but to say this is an area that some of us are beginning to work on of how um, museums can deal with historic archival collections when they don't have an archivist um, and how to um, it's kind of separate out um, the historic paper materials and the um, uh, and the collections records and uh, photographs are always an interesting area depending on your type of museum you may or may not consider them collections items as opposed to documentation of your collection. Um, so um, 
we, I think we included this because we know that archival materials are a problem for collections professionals. Um, not that we necessarily have an answer. Um, uh, this, is, to, this is something that, I was gonna say, this is something that we've dealt with in natural history for a long time because frequently specimens come in with field books and maps and things that mm -hmm. are not cataloged, but that is a core documentation. It is not captured in the catalog because of the amount of it. And what the tradition has been there has been to link when you get your specimens uh, cataloged is to link the catalog number back to that documentation. And usually that was done by physically noting the numbers on the appropriate spots in field books and on maps where that, that correlate to specimens. The one thing natural history collections have not been good at is housing the material properly, but it is actually extremely valuable. And that's an old, old tradition. And I would think the same would apply to other museums as well, that linking that those, in this case, specifically photographs, but any information like that to the object record is really important. Is that a, a proper interpretation, uh, Janice? Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I think that's the, the, you know, it is a challenge, you know, throughout. Um, I think one of the big issues that we really need to sort of address, and, and I think I feel strongly about, is archival materials I would not catalog within the same system as objects. Um, and we need to, I think as a field, and to work with our friends in, in archives and our colleagues in archives is to figure out how we deal with archival materials in a cataloging system, but not integrate that necessarily into the object catalog system. Um, and I know that some museums have tended to do that. And I think, um, I think it, it lends to more confusion than to basically say, I have a separate collection here. Um, and I think that's some, we're gonna get into hopefully talking about different types of collections uh, in a little bit. That there, a question did come up specifically about art notebooks. Um, and I think that's where, where we're looking at, depending on your type of museum, in many art museums, um, the photographs are, photographs are a, a, a part of the, the uh, object collection. And I think that, um, uh, there, the the way you deal with an artist's sketches and and notebooks and things is different in an art museum than in a uh, history or natural history or anthropological collection, and I don't have a lot of experience with that. Suzanne, do you have? Some? <laughs> I, I, all I, can, I mean, I'm just looking at the question that's been asked, which is, um, you know, if someone would like to remove a page from an art notebook to be framed. Um, I wondered if, you know, and I haven't had to deal too much with that, but could you um, make a facsimile of the page that you're removing, make a note of it and insert it where it, the one that you're moving is? I mean, if it's that, you know, if you don't want to um, disrupt the, the connection of the material together and then frame the one that is the original, put it on the wall, and perhaps it needs to stay in a mat stored rather than putting it back into the book because for some reason it's important in its own right. But I understand mm -hmm. the importance between all the materials together too. Would that, that might be, and maybe other people have dealt with this more and have other suggestions, but that just kind of came to mind. Yeah, I think that that's a, 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 a it's a, it's a balance between, um, uh, the integrity of, of the, the archival or historic nature of it um, and the artistic value. I mean, we've all certainly seen framed images of, of da Vinci's notebooks. Um, and um, so I think it becomes a, a question of, of the extent to which it, it, the, the cure, and I think it may be a curatorial issue uh, as well. Um. Uh, you're right too. I because I, you don't want to go tearing things out of stuff and you know without talking to conservator and a curator probably because maybe it is more significant to keep it all to, together. Yeah. But anyway, just to I mean, hold I that. Pers personally, go with the facsimile, but you know, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm more of a history and, and natural history person and would want to keep the Audubon drawings together as opposed to taking them out of the book. <laughs> All right, what's next? Sorry, my slides are not advancing. There we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's a... Uh, <laughs> uh, in some interesting questions. Um, we talked a little bit in our previous, in our sort of run up to this discussion of um, uh, valuation on deed of gift. And um, I th there, the, the, the general sort of opinion seems to be either you don't put values on the deed of gift at all, and that's a totally separate document, or you indicate that that is not something that the museum provided. Um, I, I have done deeds of gift where the, it said um, value provided by donor, um, but, um, uh, and certainly getting into arm wrestling with a donor about what goes on the deed of gift is, is an interesting challenge. Um, and, you know, the, the simple answer may be not to include value on the, the document deed of gift because that can be put elsewhere. Um, and doesn't have to go onto that particular document. Now my take on this is that it's very important information to keep. Even if the uh, donor's estimate is way off base, it's valuable information relating to the donation. But the issue I have with it being on the deed of gift is even if it states on the deed of gift, this information was provided by the donor, uh, in the future, are people going to really understand that? You might have a, an issue, an, an instance where a donor takes a deed of gift because their copy is going to have that information there as well and uses that with the IRS as proof of value of a donation in order to receive their tax benefit. Mm -hmm. That could come yeah. back to the museum because if the IRS was not very clear about where that number came from, they could then take away your 501c3 status because you were evaluating, you were making an appraisal in, in their eyes of, of a gift that you then received. So I would keep it out of the deed of gift because the chance of an appearance of a conflict of interest, mm -hmm. even though everybody's being honest, the, appear the chance of an appearance of conflict of interest is very high and it could have some serious consequences. So maybe an addendum to the deed of gift, page two, somewhere else, but. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, uh, I'm gonna skip to that bottom one, donations to the museum are tax deductible. Um, the phrase that I think everybody's using now is to the extent allowable by law. Um, and that that is um, uh, pretty much a, um, a, a standard in, in the nonprofit world. Um, and uh, the other sort of top I, idea that comes up from this is it is not our responsibility to determine whether something can be a tax deduction or not. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking, does, could that, yeah. that probably should be removed, that statement? Is that, it seems like it, it doesn't really, it tangles things well, up in an area that the museum doesn't want to be in. But by making that statement, you're telling the donor you're a 501c3, which is right. fine. Yeah. You're not yeah. telling them what level of gift, how to get a donation. All you're saying is, to the extent allowable by law, we take donations. We, and you can even say, as many do, we are a 501c3. Right. Therefore, gifts can be tax deductible. But always refer people off to the IRS. Don't mm -hmm. give them yeah. any numbers. Um. And then the, the middle question, I think, is, is, is a, a, an interesting one. Again, it refers to types of collection and, and specific use. Um, and the question really is, do you put on a deed of gift if it is not going into the permanent collection? Um, what do you share with the donor uh, about the use of, of, of the donation? 
Um, John was shaking yeah. his head. I'm yeah, let I him would. I, I would never. I would never put a purpose on the deed of gift because once that object is given to you, it's yours to do with as you see fit. You might fully intend to put that in the permanent collection and keep it forever and later decide that no, we're changing our direction. It's no longer appropriate. We want to deaccession it. We want to move it to the education collection. It's damaged. We're going to let people use it until it breaks and we'll throw it out. Something like that. And by putting anything on the deed of gift about what collection it's going to or anything like that puts a condition on the gift, which and I would avoid conditions on gifts just as a general rule. Interesting. I have in the past um, written that they will, the pieces will be going to the education collection. Um, and that, um, that it, it was sort of a, a preemptive strike to keep donors from saying, well, why isn't it on, on exhibit? Um, and um, it, in a sense, it, 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 it um, may help with the valuation as well. You know, this isn't the great and wonderful object you think it is. Um, so be, so sort of be prepared that you're not going to get a huge tax deduction, but it is still incredibly useful to us. Um, there were some questions in this area also about whether or not you should tell your donor that it's going to be sold. Um, you know, that that is the intended purpose, that you have no, no, real use for it in the museum. And that is the, an important piece of information because it changes the deductibility for the donor. Um, so you really, you do need to let them know whether or not it will be part of the intended purpose of, of the museum. Um, any type of collections use, whether it is hands-on, whether it is, um, education, whether it is a, an exhibit prop, even if it's going to be displayed um, in somebody's office as for educational purposes, um, is still part of the purpose of the museum. Um, the, the thing that is not part of the purpose of the museum is selling it for money. Um, there was a question about sending out blank signed 8283 forms. Care. That's a practice. <laughs> yeah. Not, not signed ones. Yeah, um, I would be very careful. Well, um, you know, it, it's sort of, I don't know that it necessarily hurts. The museum is the last signatory on the 8283 form. Um, donors often don't have the form or know they need it until April 14th. Um, so it is not necessarily a bad thing to say, you know, you may need to use this form. Uh, I think it's fine to send the form out blank, but I thought Linda had said something, having it signed in turn, oh, I would not, blank form, yeah, I no. would not, yeah. I think sending out a sample, sending out a blank one should, should be fine. Yeah. It's accessible on the internet yeah. and I've certainly, directed um it's nice you know the internet's there and people email and you could send them a link and say here it is too which is nice and, and i think that's yeah. fine um because it yeah. also clues them in if oh wow you know i don't often make donations but you know this is a really high value it's over five thousand dollars and i might have to start thinking about this and it's better yeah. if they're aware. You don't want to send the form for two reasons. One of which is it's tantamount to giving tax advice, which you should not do. The other yeah. reason is you may send the wrong form. Mm. You may send a perfectly good form to that donor in mm. February and by April that could be a different form. Always oh, yeah. tell them to go get the form from the IRS. You can tell them it exists, tell them to go get it. Do not be the supplier. Okay. Because that puts good you idea. in an awkward situation should there be a change in the law. True. Very good idea. And, you know, you, the, as, as we said, the museum is the last signatory because they are agreeing that what's on the form has been donated. So don't, don't sign it until right. you've seen the, the rest of it. Mm -hmm. True. A um, couple of deaccessioning questions. Um... I am not in favor of a collections policy that says you tell the donor that your their object right. is being deaccessioned. 
Um, I know some museums feel that that's a, pol a, a, a polite thing to do, but it's not a very, it, it opens up a lot more questions than it answers. Um, and as John has said, once it's given to you, it's given to you right. to do what, what it is, what you choose. Now, there may be times that um, in a small museum, um, you want to have an informal conversation with the family or with the donor to explain the situation. But as an overall policy, um, it is, it, it's a lot more problematic. Um, I don't know if we'll ever come to a day when deaccessioning is understood by the general public, <laughs> let alone by our colleagues. Um, <laughs> Never. But, but to tell somebody, you know, thank you very much for the sewing machine your grandmother gave us 50 years ago, but we have 7,000 like them and we're getting rid of yours. Um, does, doesn't make anybody happy. Um, there was this question also about um, items deaccessioned but retained in the collection or items we wish to deaccession but no one seems interested in. I, this is really interesting, but illegal to sell. Um, there was also a question, a couple of questions that came up about, um, do we really have to destroy things if, if nobody wants them? Um, and, or if something is so badly damaged? And the answer is, yeah, you really do uh, document your destruction of something that is so badly damaged that it has no value to it. Um, I've, I've seen cases where things have been put out on the loading dock um, and um, that's not a very good practice <laughs> um, because you never know where it's going to end up or who's going to find out about it. Um, so um, uh, and deaccessioning is usually removing from your permanent object collection. So you can certainly deaccession something from the permanent collection and keep it in the museum for another purpose, um, at, for a different type of collection. Um, so that, um, yeah, thing, things sit there. Um, and I know that there have been instances um, in, in certain cases where Native American material, particularly ancestral remains, have been deaccessioned as, as a step in, in terms of making right the fact that they shouldn't be in the collection without actually yet having a plan for return. So those are some of the things that will come up like that. John? I was going to say part of that question is about ivory and it may be possible to uh, also to send ivory objects to, an to another museum. What you want to look at is the age of the ivory. Uh -huh and whether it was obtained pre-act or not. And that, that gets you into a whole new set of questions, but you can, you can look into that. In many cases, I've, I've seen people that had ivory objects they thought they could not sell, which in fact they could with the right permits and with the right documentation. Mm -hmm. In some instances you cannot because you can't document it. But. Okay, there were a couple of questions. Did you wanna take? Um, but I don't see any actually on deaccessioning. Uh, um, well, there's, there's a question that goes back to uh, the purpose use of the gift have implication yep. for taxes. And yes, we want to reiterate, if it is being used for an educational purpose by the museum, uh, even if it is not going into the permanent collection, uh, if it is being kept by the museum, then that is a related use. If it is being sold, um, then it is, that is the not related use. I don't know, can anybody think of any other not related uses that, that somebody would take an object for? I think it's pretty much, you're either keeping it for a use by the museum or you are taking it to, to raise money, which is not a related use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, tiered collections, we will get to that, I hope, because there's a, 
collect this. A, a question coming up on collection types. So I think we'll hold yeah. that one to the side, if that's okay. Yeah. There are some other questions on specifics on the 8283. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe we'll move on unless you guys want to look at those specifically. There's one related to the deed that I thought, you know, it's like, do you want to send the deed of gift form out prior to works going before the board? And I, I would not do that because if they decline, then you kind of open up a can of worms. Um, that would be, and that's not so hot. So it's better to make sure it's accepted before you start the formal process of getting the deed signed. I don't know if Janice or John feel differently. Um, no, I usually, for me, the deed to gift is, is the last step. Um, yep. But I know people do it differently. Um, but as, as um, you know, that to me is the, the sort of document that pulls all together all the pieces. My deed of gift has, has usually said the donor offers and the museum accepts the following items. Um, so that that is, is the, the sort of um, culmination of, of the process uh, rather than the, the um, uh, sort of any step in between. Yeah, there are. Um, I, I personally have not run into many issues where, you know, you, you get to the point of everybody says, yes, we want it, and the donor says, well, never mind. Yeah. Um, but if that's what's going to happen before the donor signs the deed of gift, that's a better place to do it than after the donor signs right. the deed of gift. There were a couple of questions about stipulations for use on deed of gift forms. Um, yeah, I saw that, and um, you know, I, I we've we've had some collect some questions. I don't know that we included them about use of collections. Um, and that's something that, as we talk about different types of collections, um, some may um, be intended for use. And, you know, I think the, the, the question, oh, Ted's question, we have a violin with the stipulation that it be played. Um, I think that's a discussion that the curator needs to have with the donor. Um, the donor may feel that it's important that it be played. Um, there are musicians who really feel strongly that way. Um, and I think that everybody needs to be in agreement that that's the appropriate thing to happen as opposed to purely preservation. Um, and I think if the museum feels that this is an instrument that should only be preserved and not played and the donor doesn't want that, I think the donor needs to find another museum. Um, uh, musical instruments are, are very tricky and your conservator should have a voice in that too because the way you conserve an instrument that's going to be kept in playable condition is not the same as the way you preserve it just to preserve it in the collection. And if you don't play it for a long period of time, uh, particularly a uh, violin, it will not mm. be playable later. And so right. that's, that's a really big decision to make, but playing uh, can in effect prolong the playable life of the instrument, but it can also result in a lot of damage. So that's when your conservator needs to be in there as well. And it should be a musical instrument conservator. So if your, your conservator doesn't have that expertise, it's time to call in an outsider in that case. Yeah, and there's also a question about um, if you don't agree with the value on the 8283 form. That's um, you, specifically, I believe, in the instructions, but I'm not sure if it's in the instructions, but it is very clear that the museum is not endorsing the value uh, by signing. It is only saying that it has received the object. Um, it, yeah, it's nice to have those instructions. Um, there are some gray areas in them. But I do think that reading those over when you're trying to solve these problems, it's, it's good to do that. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, oh, the, uh, the value. Um, I, you might, depending on your relationship with the donor, want to have a discussion with them that you feel there may be a, an, an issue about the value. 
um, but that uh, in, in, in many ways, that's none of your business. Um, the donor does not need to share the, the appraisal with you. Um, and that's, you know, that's between the donor and the appraiser. Um, so um, I'm going to bring up a point here about the appraisal, if that's okay. Cause I, I mean, I worked for a university art museum and I used to say that, yeah, it's none of our business. We do not require an appraisal. We do though, the university does now. And if it's over $5,000 um, and they want the university to sign an 8283 form, they require the appraisal. Hmm. And so, I mean, as much as I kind of, I was like, oh, I was dragging my feet on it. You know, I felt like this is really the IRS and it's not us and we are not the IRS. I think the university felt that that was but Important. doesn't the IRS also require an appraisal for something over 5,000? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a, so you can just ask for a copy of that appraisal. Yes. And I used to not do that because I thought I was overstepping and infringing because it was not, you know, once again, we're always like, this is not my business, oh. but the university now is like wanting to, yeah. and, and has for several years now. Well, university museums are in an awkward place position because uh, they frequently don't own their collection, the university does, and things like development, which if you're in a freestanding museum, development works for you in a university, they don't work for you, they work for the university, and so they may have all kinds of different rules, and what you could do in this case, Suzanne, is you could have the university office that wanted the appraisal be the ones to go get it. You can give them the information on the donor and tell them that you cannot uh, ethically ask for that appraisal, but you can tell them they had to have one done if it's over 5,000. They can go ask for it, but you, the museum, will not ask for it. Um, it's, tr yeah, I, I, yeah. I, mean, I guess we could. It's a little tricky because sometimes my relationship with the donor is stronger mm -hmm. than, than even the, the development person um, who may not even really know them. Um, but we, we try to work those things out. But you're right, every once in a while, there is a problem. Someone, something happens, some, we, you know. Yeah, university so have museums rip. have their own sets of problems. Right. We do, we do. Uh, and that, and, and I, I didn't bring this up, but I'll go ahead and back up. I don't want to get too off time, but we do put our value, I mean, we do have a line that says on our deed for insurance value, um, you know, if known, and we let the donor write that in there if he or she wants to. And the donor is the last person to sign up on the deed. I do see, and I think John and I have discussed this in detail, there are some issues to be concerned about and to be aware of. But I think that's the way it is right now with us. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the point is when you work for a larger entity, um, you can't always explain some of the, the, the ins and outs that, that we understand as being problematic. And by and large, donors do tend to go along with those requirements. Um, and it would, it would be interesting, but probably not particularly pleasant to have an instance where the donor says, I'm not giving you the appraisal, too bad. You want the object, you get it without the appraisal. Um, but let's, let's not worry yeah. about it. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> moving on, moving on. Thank you. It's a whole we other webinar. Yeah. yeah, it is, okay. it is. There were a couple, of, a number of questions that came up about loans to um, galleries, to uh, organizations, to, I love this one, to Hollywood Productions, um, yes. to, and there are for-profit museums. Um, and I think that the, 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 um, the answer is to always go back to your policy and procedure. What are the purpose and your mission? What are the purposes of your loans and what are the requirements that you have to keep your objects safe? Um, uh, right. And make sure that all of that is in the, in the, the loan agreement. Um, it would, may take some, some modifications in various places. Um, uh, but you need to, to, you know, go back to first principles of, is this a uh, purpose that is in keeping with the museum's mission? 
and can we do it safely for the objects? And particularly for a commercial gallery, I would want that purpose in writing because the purpose of borrowing your stuff may be to affect the value of things they're selling. Mm -hmm. They may be they may be wanting to exhibit other works by an artist, for example, because they have other they have their own works of that artist they want to sell. And by putting them in the context of, look, this artist is good enough, it's at the XYZ Museum, that could affect cost. And that is, again, can reflect negatively on your institution, even though you had nothing to do with it. Uh, about the props, I would also caution people to be extremely careful on that one. A few years ago, the Martin Guitar Museum loaned a very rare guitar to a Hollywood production company because they wanted it to be in a shot in the movie and Martin Guitar wanted the guitar to be shown and uh, somewhere along the line things got screwed up and, and, and in the process of filming the scene one of the actors picked the guitar up and smashed it. So even John, if the conservator John. had been on site, this would this would could not have been stopped. It just happened, and so this is the kind of you oh have to God. consider all of these options and what can happen. Of course, the guitar was insured, but it will and it could be to some degree restored. It could never go back to where it was. So you need to think of it, think through all of the things that can happen. The other thing about commercial art galleries is uh, that I would question is do they have the staff to properly handle in the way we would handle things in a museum? And the answer could be yes. There are some very good galleries out there, but uh, I would have severe, serious questions about that and what their circumstances were, for example, of allowing people in, are they gonna have a wine reception? You know, a lot more issues than you would have loaning to a fellow uh, 501c3 institution. I would think too, one more thing real quickly is to make sure that it's clear that your object is not for sale. <laughs> Yes, yes. That was, it might just by being in that gallery um, and, and there may be some, I mean, galleries with really, you know, great guidelines and their facilities are intact and really, you know, and that's fine. And, and it's maybe a scholarly, scholarly exhibition that's important for whatever reasons. But yeah, I would be clear that it's not for sale, maybe even have it noted as such visibly. Yeah, and you, you know, there are situations where you might want to, you know, really sit and negotiate. Is it, um, uh, can, can you keep the, the, the sort of indication of things that are, are for sale at a very low level or even, you know, not have that indicated as part of, of that particular exhibit? Um, there was a question before, oh, um, just to, to sort of um, go slightly down the um, filming rabbit hole. Um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, we need to remember is that, uh, as John pointed out, when, when filming takes place, you have no control over enforcing anything. Um, and if you're going to allow uh, a really outside entity like a, a, a Hollywood filming or any filming or a great number of things, um, you have to be willing to have awful things happen to the objects because they may very, very may, very well may happen. So, Linda, are there more questions we need to, to look at? Uh, someone just asked who the actor was. It was, it was Kurt Russell. <laughs> and I liked him. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, we may want to move on. Okay. Ah, this had a lot, a lot of um, um, discussion uh, together with, should we accept things that people bring to the door? How do we discourage it? How do we stop it? And also, do we have concerns with people now that are bringing us things that may have viral uh, DNA on them? Um, my sort of feeling is discouraging is a good idea. Um, um, forbidding, um, I've been in situations where if we hadn't taken something, um, not only would it have been lost, but we would have lost some, some, some things that would have been very valuable to the collection. Um, you know, make it prominent on your website about, you know, how you will accept donations. But there are a lot of people who think that, you know, that if they come to the museum with an object, they something will happen with that. 
and they won't take any subsequent action. If you say, no, you can't leave it, or we can't give you a receipt or one of those things, it, it gets some other, some other thing is done to it. Um, no, I would talk to your frontline staff, especially the weekenders, about not doing this. And if it's going to happen anyway, or if you're going to allow it, make sure you have a very simple form they can mm -hmm. get the donor to fill out with the donor's contact information. What usually happens is the person says, oh, I'll, I'll phone later and explain and give you the information. And the, and the frontline person is busy. This is not their regular job. They're busy with just getting people in and out of the building. They don't know to capture the information. So make sure it's a receipt signed by the person receiving it two copies one copy goes to the donor one copy stays with the museum so that you can find that person later yeah i think that that you know it if you're not going to forbid it and my preference would be not to forbid it is you need to have a lot of good information about exactly what to do available to the public right. and then you need to have information at your at your front desk for your frontline people to say this if you're not going to call for an appointment this is what will happen you know and we're not we're you know all those things about if you leave it here we may uh and don't pick it up we have the right to get rid of it or you know this is not saying we're going to accept it for the collection and curator will be in touch with you yeah, the other issue is making sure you have a place for your frontline people then to put that object because incoming objects are one of the chief sources of pests coming into museums. Mm -hmm. And particularly those coming mm -hmm. from a private donor may have been in a basement or a garage full of roaches. You, you need to have a place where you can quarantine that object yeah. until Monday when your collection staff has a chance to really look it over and see what's going on. So you, you don't want them taking it back to the curator's office and leaving it or dropping it off anywhere near the collection. So you okay. need to identify a spot if you're gonna do that. Okay, we do have under 10 minutes left. Are there any particular topics, panelists, out of these last you want to make sure to get to? <laughs> collections um, types, collections committees. Yeah, this is, this is a, I have this question for John, actually. <laughs> I, I, I do too. <laughs> um, there are now a number of different types of collections that we acknowledge as having. I mean, we started out in the days where we had a permanent collection or the collection, uh, and we had standards of care for it, and our policies talked about these are the standards of care. But it's over the years, we are, have accepted that there are different types of collections. There are study collections, there are hands-on collections, there are exhibit collections, there are education collections. And we've talked a little bit about how we know that that we may have different standards of care and that ideally in your collections management policy you identify your different types of collections and different levels of what levels of care you have for that is john have you written about this yet <laughs> uh, well it was covered in in the second edition of things great and small that you should do it i did not get into the level of detail of what your how your standards of care should differ because that's going to depend on the collection and what it's going to be used for but i certainly agree that should be in your policy uh, ideally in a museum we would give the highest standard of care to every object but that's not going to happen in this world so you do have to uh, allocate your 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 care time and resources uh, very carefully and so no i i agree with you 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 should have that the matter of policy and the level of care should be stated in the policy to whatever degree you can describe that but i have not actually written one of those myself but i have seen them and uh, i do recommend doing that um, i i was wondering too about accepting non collection or accepting items that are not not you don't plan to accession, and I would really try to not do that if if it seems like that's well, dip, you know. wouldn't it depend on why you're accepting it? Someone might give you, for instance, artworks that they know are not of the quality that your museum wants, so that so that your museum can sell them and use the money, and you would not accession those. You would take them. It, and 
bundle them off to an auction and sell them. I suppose, but I need to think about my museum's mission and Mm -hmm. what we're doing. And I don't, for me at least, that doesn't seem to make sense with what we do. So, but maybe it would for another institution. Well, but if the intention is not to put them in the collection, why it would not interfere with the mission. It would give you a source of income. And if your mission includes ed- educational collection, collections or props for an historic house or something like that, then you're, yeah, that is part, then part of your mission. But having someone give you a gift where they know in advance when they mm-hmm. give it to you that you're not going to keep it, that should not be an issue of the mission unless, unless it's selling something that you don't want associated with your museum, such as pornographic materials or racist materials or something mm-hmm. like that, that you would find contrary to uh, your general beliefs. Um, okay. And I think um, the, if we sort of move ahead, there's a, yep. uh, a, a question on, we've put together a question on accessioning versus, um, ah, it's pretty far along. Uh, <laughs> Accessioning versus um, acquisitions. Um, And many of us consider accessioning to be the permanent collection um, that's given the the catalog number. Things that are go into the education collection or the props collection or or the exhibit collection or hands-on or teaching are not accessioned. They are um, given a separate numbering system. Um, and so, um, there is a difference between acquiring title to something, um, and for me, accessioning, uh, into the permanent collection, only things that go into the permanent collection are accessioned. The other collections I would not consider to be accessioned. Okay. I, I agree. Uh, oh, collecting versus collections policies. Um, a couple of questions came up um, that the difference between a collecting policy or uh, collecting plan or scope of collection statement and your collections management policies. Um, and the reason that I think we threw this in was um, the, um, uh, the collecting policy, the scope of collections, the collecting plan, comes from your mission and it is something that your board puts together. Um, uh, There was a a, a suggestion here that the collecting plan was something that the um, collections management team created. Um, That has, that comes from the top. Um, You may have an informal one because the people at the top have not managed to write you a reasonable collecting plan. Um, but that is something that comes from the mission. Um, and your collections management policies are should also be board approved. Uh, I once worked at an institution that managed to get around some of this by saying, the collection management policies and procedures are board approved, but our practices are uh, informal. <laughs> I think your collection plan also should be a lot more detailed than you would want to include in your policy. Your yes. policy should refer to the collection pl- uh, collection plan. They should be in sync, but your collection plan itself should be a completely separate, very detailed document that you change up as you need. And But your general collecting policy should be that you're following your collection, collection plan, but the plan should be re- pretty detailed and not something you want to clutter up your policy document with. Well, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, we're coming up on the end of the hour, what? and we still have one very important question, which was the first one asked in Q&A, and it's relevant because anything that wasn't answered here, there will be a source to go to. So, John, do you want to answer the question about MRM6? Yeah. Oh, do we know when MRM6 will be published? Uh, good question. Uh, yes, uh, we got caught in the hiatus of the uh, COVID virus. Like everybody else, uh, Roman and Littlefield, the publisher, had to shut down back in March. They are now functioning again. And uh, Tony Kaiser and I signed off on the uh, final proofs last week. As far as we know, the book should be at the printer as we speak. We are expecting copies to show up in the warehouse, hopefully the first week of July. We do not have a definite guarantee on that, but July is is what we're looking at, early July. And uh, so 
that's that is the latest you can pre-order the book from the the publisher's website but it is it is back in production you know the original publication date had been to coincide with the aam meeting but because of the shutdown that just didn't happen okay and that brings us up to three o'clock i want to thank our panelists for all the work they put in thinking about this ahead of time and all the answers that they were able to give today so um hey, i'm going to interrupt i know it's our it's it's we're out of time but um i really 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 want to thank sebastian encina for all of the work that he has done to put all these things together this past two weeks so um, he really did so much in organizing. So thank you, Sebastian, um, for doing all this for our community and bringing everybody together. Here, yes, here, here. He's been a driving force for this um, and we do appreciate him. So yes, thank you, Suzanne. Um, thank you to the panelists and to everyone who's attended today or in previous sessions. Um, and we will see you on another webinar sometime soon. Thank you. Yay. Bye.